morning, everyone, and welcome to our online service. Let us begin our worship this morning by singing the introit. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. Let all the earth keep silence before you. Keep silence. Keep silence before you. This morning's call to worship is taken from Psalm 69. Verses 30 to 33. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Now we'll have a time of praise and oration by Tracy and Wang Ping, followed by prayer by Perry.
Dear Heavenly Father, your children have gathered in mind to worship you. Abba, you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and truth. You are compassionate to us, treading our iniquities under your foot. Unlike mankind, you do not grow tired or weary. Father, we come to you in confession. Like the churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, we are prone to spiritual apathy. Somehow, one way or another, our love for you wanes over time. We follow the same pattern as the churches in Ephesus, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea. Starting off with a loss of love for you, we settle for cold orthodoxy. Slowly, we compromise our faith, tolerating the world. We become enamored with things of this world, losing our passion for Christ to the extent of even trading the sufficiency, fullness, and wholeness of Christ for something else. This leads to an eventual tolerance of sin, finally indifference to the gospel, and spiritual death. Father, we are sorry for forgetting the love that we once had for you. We thank you for being patient with us. Above all else, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. For true Christ, we have a great high priest who not only intercedes for us, but he is also able to sympathize with our weakness. One who in every respect has been tempted as we are, but without sin. As we come together to draw close to you, we ask of you to speak to us through your vessel. Help us to rekindle and cultivate our love for you. Give us passion for our Savior. Help us to remain devoted to his sufficiency and fullness, reminding us that we are made complete in him. Lead us to desire for others to come to him. Make us eager in evangelism. We come to you in surrender. Search us, for you know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing Gloria Petri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This week's memory verses are taken from Psalm 34 verses 9 to 11. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Today's scripture reading is taken from Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city and proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. Okay, so last week uh, we were looking at the half-hearted obedience of Jonah when he was at Nineveh. Okay, we talked about just how much was missing in Jonah's sermon to the Ninevites. Okay, Jonah had said to them, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. But there was no mention of why Nineveh will be overthrown. There was no mention of what the Ninevites are supposed to do to be in the right with God. 
And especially we talked about how there was no mention of the gracious and the merciful attributes of God. This was a graceless sermon. It was just all about the justice of God and the wrath of God against Nineveh. And so we saw that uh, what Jonah is actually doing here is he's trying to once again sabotage God's sovereign plan. Because Jonah thinks that if he preaches this half-hearted, incomplete sermon, then perhaps the Ninevites will not repent. And so they will be destroyed by God. And so later on, they will not come and invade his nation, Israel, anymore. Because you remember, that's what this is all about, right? Jonah loves his nation so much okay, that he doesn't want to help out a people who in the future are going to come and destroy his own people. Because Jonah's allegiance is with Israel more than it is with God himself. And so we come to uh, today's passage, which starts from chapter 3, verse 5. And it says, The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. You know, there are many miracles in the book of Jonah, right? Firstly, there was a storm that was so huge that seasoned sailors were terrified. And then the lot fell on Jonah. That's another miracle. And then the sea miraculously ceased from its raging when Jonah was thrown into it. And then a huge fish swallowed Jonah alive and saved him from drowning. And then Jonah's life was kept preserved inside the belly of the fish for three days. And then the fish vomited Jonah out onto dry land. Okay? These are all miracles. It's just miracle after miracle after miracle. But you know what the greatest miracle in the book of Jonah was? It was this verse. That an entire ancient city consisting of more than 120,000 people repented and humbled themselves at such a deficient, graceless preaching by Jonah. Okay, because imagine listening to a sermon like that. In 40 days, you're going to die. Okay, it's so cold and loveless. It's just truth without grace. And yet, such a powerful response by the Ninevites. This was nothing short of a miracle. Wrought by the Holy Spirit of God, who was working in these Ninevites' hearts, softening those hearts to be able to respond in this way. Because as Christians, we know how hard it is, right? When we talk to non-Christians, we know how hard it is to change one person's heart, don't we? Just one person's heart. It takes years of effort. And many times their hearts never change. Isn't that right? But Jonah's sermon, flawed and incomplete as it was, flipped an entire city upside down in just a single day. It took Jonah one day to bring an entire city on its knees in repentance before God. It's a miracle. But you know, there are commentators that say, oh, the Ninevites... They didn't really repent. Their repentance wasn't really genuine. These people never really became believers. But you know, that's not what Jesus said. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Look what Jesus says, first of all. Jesus, in this verse, is affirming that the Ninevites in the book of Jonah were a real people who actually existed. Who actually repented at Jonah's preaching, okay? Those Ninevites were not part of some fairy tale story. The repentance 
of the Ninevites was a historical event affirmed by Jesus Christ. These were real people. How do we know that these were real people? Because Jesus says those people, those Ninevites are going to rise from the dead on the day of judgment. Okay, and they're going to condemn the generation of Jews who never repented at Jesus' preaching. They're going to tell the Jews of Jesus' day, if we Ninevites repented at such imperfect preaching by Jonah, by someone who didn't even like us, why didn't you guys repent when the Son of God became a human being and came into this world and preached you the perfect sermon? God himself in human flesh was preaching to you. And yet you guys didn't repent. That's what they're going to say. So Jesus says these Ninevites, they're going to be given the, the task of judgment when he returns. Uh, which is exactly what Paul wrote, wrote about Christians in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, you Christians at Corinth, Corinth, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Okay, saints will judge the world. Which means what? These Ninevites that repented at the preaching of Jonah are counted as one of those saints, equivalent in status with Christians, with us. They're saints. And you ask, how is that possible? How can these Ninevites be considered saints when they were so wicked because it says in today's passage that the Ninevites believed God and you know what that phrase reminds us of well actually that exact Hebrew construction for believed believed God is found in Genesis 15 when it talks about Abraham's faith Genesis 15 verses 5 to 6. And he, God, brought him, Abraham, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he, Abraham, believed the Lord. And he, that is God, counted it to him as righteousness. You see that? Abraham believed the Lord. The same grammatical construction as the Ninevites believed God. Which means what? It's the same faith. Same faith. Just as Abraham simply took God at his word. When God said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. The Ninevites in Jonah also simply took God at his word. Because that's what believing in God means. It is to simply say yes and an amen to whatever God tells you in His Word. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites simply and genuinely believed that that's what's going to happen. And in their actions, they responded like that's what's going to happen. Hence the fasting and the putting on of sackcloth. And you see, such simple faith was counted to the Ninevites as righteousness, just as it was to Abraham. Because that's all it takes for you to be counted as righteous in God's eyes. So you don't have to do anything. It's not by works. No matter how sinful you were, all you need to do is to really take God at His word. And when you do, at that moment you are counted as righteous in God's eyes. You are counted as one of the saints. See, that's the doctrine of justification by faith alone. The Ninevites simply believe God and so they had God's own righteousness imputed to them. 
This is why Jesus says on the day of judgment, they will rise from the dead into a glorious resurrection, given the task of judging the world along with all the other believers throughout history. Hey, so focusing on this verse again, yes, it was a sheer miracle that these Ninevites were able to respond like this at such an incomplete sermon with genuine repentance and faith. But I just want to ask here, how were the Ninevites able to respond like this? I mean, yes, as I said, uh, it's by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work as Jonah was preaching. But when we read the history of the nation of Assyria during this time, we see how the Holy Spirit had already been working in the background for many years in preparation for this moment. You see, when Jonah went to preach to the Ninevites, the nation of Assyria was having a bit of a year 2020 moment, if you know what I mean. Okay, Assyria, like the world in 2020, was not in a good place at all. Okay, look what this one commentator says. Given the knowledge of Jonah's general period of ministry, we can ascertain that the story occurred during a time of Assyrian weakness. In the first half of the 8th century BC, Assyria was fighting to defend itself against the Arameans and the Uratians. The Assyrian Apennine Chronicle records that Assyria's troubles were aggravated by famine and internal revolts, all of which explain the increasing impotence of the Assyrian monarchs towards the middle of the 8th century BC. You see, this gives us some indication as to why the hearts of the Ninevites were so soft when Jonah arrived at Nineveh. You see, during that time, there was pressure from without. There were foreign armies continually attacking Assyria. There was also pressure from within. There was famine. Okay? There was no food. People were going hungry. It's like, it's a bit like with us today, isn't it? With all the economic recession all around us. And then there was internal revolts. There was, there was civil unrest. There was infighting among the Assyrians. You think of the USA today with all the racial tensions, the riotings, the political unrest. That's what was happening in Assyria, in Nineveh at that time. Okay, not only that, okay, look what this one commentator says. Jonah most likely preached in Nineveh during the reign of Asher Dan III. Okay, so that's the king who was reigning at the time when Jonah was preaching. Asher Dan III had been unsuccessful in reversing the deterioration of foreign affairs, which had begun around 785 BC. He also had to contend with plagues and internal revolt. Plagues, like an infectious disease. So I was, when I read that, it just intrigued me because of, obviously because of what's happening in the world today. So I did a bit more research about this king who was king during the time when Jonah went there to preach. Is what it says. Asher then the third was the king of Assyria between 772 BC and 755 BC and presided over a period of internal and uh, internal social and political strife. He succeeded his brother as king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 773 BC. However, he was never able to gain de facto power of Assyria due to certain royal members of the palace court. His leadership was limited by the influence of the commander of the military known as the Tatanu, named uh, Shemshu Ilu, who held, who held considerable power within Assyria. And then look what this says. Within a few years of his reign, the civilization of Assyria was wrought with a deadly plague in 765 BC. And this caused Ashurdan III to forego the annual military campaign as per ancient custom and tradition. In 763 BC, following the strife, 
a revolution broke out among the populace, and this would last until 759 BCE, when another deadly plague would strike Assyria. Does that sound familiar? See, as you listen to that, I hope you're finally seeing why the book of Jonah is so relevant for us today. Okay, perhaps when we started getting into Jonah, you may have been wondering, why are we suddenly doing Jonah? So random. Actually, I didn't even know why I was doing Jonah until I started reading all this stuff about the background history of Assyria during that time. You see, Assyria in Jonah's day was pretty much the world today in 2020. There was a deadly plague, a revolution breaking out among the populace, internal social and political strife, and then a second wave. Did you read that? Assyria was hit with a second wave in 759 BC. History repeats itself, doesn't it? It certainly does. And you know, this, this one commentator summed it up the best, okay? He said, for 36 years, from 781 to 745 BC, Assyria was practically paralyzed. That whole nation was practically paralyzed. And when I read that, I thought, that sure sounds like lockdown to me. Assyria, like us today, was under lockdown due to political crisis, financial crisis, social crisis, and, like with us, a health crisis. And you see, it was to such a city, a city reeling from all these calamities and judgments from heaven, that the prophet Jonah was sent. It was to such a city in a mess. You see, it wasn't like Jonah just went up to Nineveh one day and just preached a sermon and, and everyone just fell down to their knees at, G at Jonah's preaching. It wasn't like that. God had been preparing the soil. He was preparing the ground for many years before Jonah showed up. God was removing the, the rocks. He was removing the thorns. He was making the ground good soil through years of humbling, absolutely humbling this nation. So when the seed of the word finally came through Jonah, it bore fruit. God had been working behind the scenes for a national revival. You see, that's why Jonah's preaching, even though it was so imperfect, it still had a profound impact because it just happened to come at the perfect timing under the sovereignty of God. Okay, so here's the application for us. Here's the application for us. When we preach the gospel... Okay, when we preach the good news, the love of Jesus to others, don't worry about whether or not you are good at it. Okay, don't worry about that. Because you don't know if or how God has been preparing the ground in the hearts of those people. You don't know how long God has already been knocking on the hearts of those people, trying to get their attention through various trials and sufferings and calamities. You don't know how much their hearts have already been humbled by the difficult, the hard things they have experienced in life. You don't know about that. Okay, so your, your preaching, your presentation of the gospel doesn't have to be great. Look at Jonah. Okay, you don't have to give people the A to Z of Christianity all the time. You can just give them A to B. Because maybe, like with Jonah, you're just there to give that person that one little nudge, that one little push in the right direction. Okay, just, just one little statement or a question to make them think. Because who knows? What you say may be that one thing that helps that person to finally cross the line from unbelief to belief.
from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Just one little nudge. You know, I remember listening to um, this testimony about a bouncer, a, a guy who used to be a bouncer uh, at a nightclub. And uh, this bouncer, uh, at one night, uh, he happened to just go home by a taxi because he just finished his shift. And so he was just going home. He took a taxi. He was going home. And the, the taxi driver, while he was driving, just asked a very simple question. The taxi driver said, Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And um, he doesn't know what happened, but w w as soon as he heard the name Jesus, that bouncer just started bawling, started crying. And at that moment, he became a born-again Christian. At just a simple question, do you know Jesus? That's all it took. And so he started crying, and, and the man became a born-again Christian. And then um, he decided to quit being a bouncer, and he uh, enrolled a Bible college, and now he's a pastor somewhere here in Brisbane. You see, for that bouncer... It was just a mere mention of the name of Jesus. It wasn't a, a great sermon. It was just, do you know Jesus? To cross the line into eternal life. Why? Because most likely, okay, I'm just assuming here, that bouncer when he was a child probably had heard the gospel somewhere. It was probably in Sunday school. So the seed was already planted deep in his heart somewhere. But when the time came, it took that Christian taxi driver to water the seed just a little bit. To just ask a single question. Do you know Jesus? And then God gave the life. You see, we just don't know what kind of preparation work the Holy Spirit has been doing in the background in people's lives without our knowledge. We don't know how many messengers God has already been sending to those people that we want to talk to. It's like with Nineveh. God had already sent many prophets to that city before Jonah in the form of a deadly disease, in the form of a famine, in the form of civil unrest. You see, these were all God's servants sent in advance to pave the way for Jonah, to prepare the way for Jonah's message. In the same way, when you are talking to an unbeliever about Jesus, God may have sent, already sent them many prophets before you, including in the form of various trials and sufferings to pave the way for you. So just go for it. Try. Who knows? You may be Jonah to that person. But... But, okay, even if that person doesn't repent at your preaching, that's okay. That's okay. Because th then that means that you are just one of those prophets that God is sending to that person to pave the way for someone else, for a Jonah in the future. As Jesus said, one person sows and another one reaps. One person sows and another one reaps. You don't have to be the one that who... That does the reaping. You don't have to be. Maybe you're just sowing. Maybe you're just watering. That's okay. And you see, this kind of approach of thinking about evangelism and mission really takes the burden off us, doesn't it? Because we see that it's not us who's doing the saving at the end of the day. It's God who's doing the save, saving. And because we see that like Jonah, we're just one piece of the puzzle in God's plan of, plan of salvation for the world. We're just one piece of the puzzle. Like Jonah was just one piece, the final piece. We don't have to be every piece. Okay, so let's continue today's passage. Verse 5, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Okay, let me finish this message this morning by focusing on this king. How was this king, who was a king, 
able to respond in this way? How could this man be so receptive to Jonah, Jonah's message? Okay. Put yourself in the shoes of this king for a moment. As we read before in that article, this king had basically spent most of his life as a loser. He was a loser. He was a king, but he wasn't really a king. He couldn't really assert his power over Assyria. He was just a king in name only, really, because some general had more power than him over Assyria. You see, nothing, absolutely nothing was going right for this man. From the moment he became king, there was enemies all around. There was famine. There was disease, internal strife. Nothing was going right for him in his life. But what was God doing with all those struggles in this king's life? As I mentioned, God was knocking on the door of his heart. That's what God was doing. God was trying to get his attention. God was warning him about the judgment to come with all these minor judgments that he had sent him beforehand. And so it was because this king had, had already heard so many knocks from God in his life. He's already heard multiple warnings before. That when Jonah came and preached his message, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This king thought, okay, if I don't respond to this message, then I'm dead. He thought, Jonah's warning is the last door knock, the last opportunity that I'm going to get from God. I better repent. And you know what he did? He got off his throne. He took off his royal robes. What does it mean? It means, God, you are the king of kings. I am not the king of kings. You are the king. You have the control, God. I don't. You have the sovereignty. I don't. You deserve the glory. I don't. That's what the king was saying. By getting off his throne, he was saying, God, you deserve to be on that seat. Not me. You deserve to be in the center of my universe. You deserve the blessing, the honor, the glory, the might. Because you are God and I am not. That's what the king was doing by this action. So let me ask this question to you again. What's God doing with the year 2020? What's God doing with a global pandemic, with financial struggles, with all this political and social unrest all over the world? What's God doing with all the flooding in China and Japan? What's God doing in all that? I would like to think that God is preparing the ground for a worldwide revival. For a worldwide revival. I really do hope so. God is hopefully removing the rocks in people's hearts. Removing the thorns. Knocking on the doors of people's hearts. Through all these things that are happening this year. So that when the people of God come out of this whole experience strong. And go out into the world again. And preach the word of God like Jonah did. Okay, not worrying about whether they're good or not then I believe the people of the world will get off their thrones, take off their royal robes, and declare that Jesus Christ alone is their king, just like this king of Nineveh. That's what I hope. I am praying that this difficult season of 2020 is all about. It's a season in which God is preparing the stage for a global awakening. But the question is, would you be ready when that time of global awakening comes? Would you be ready? And would you be willing when that time of awakening finally comes? Or when that awakening comes, 
would you still be asleep in your sins? Because think about it. How can you be ready to tell other people to get off their thrones and let Jesus Christ alone be king when you yourself haven't got off your throne? When you yourself is still the center of your universe? When you yourself is still the master, the controller of your own life? How could you tell non-Christians to confess Jesus Christ as Lord when the time comes? You see, revival has to always start with us Christians, us believers. Okay, you remember the four spiritual laws? Okay, let's get to the basics, shall we? Let's get back to the basics. We have to stop living the self-directed life where self is on the throne, where our interests are directed by self, where it's just all about self. Yeah, we learned this stuff when we first became Christians, but are we still like this as Christians? A self-directed life. No, we must live a Christ-directed life where Christ is on the throne, where Christ is on the center of our universe and our self is merely yielding to Christ. Where all our interests are directed by Christ and Christ alone. Okay, we have to get back to the basics. We have to get off our thrones first before we tell other people to let Jesus Christ alone be king. Okay, so let's do that this morning. Let's do that today. Let's turn away from this self-directed life. Let's get off the throne. Let's get away from the center and let Jesus Christ reign in our lives as Lord. So that we can prepare ourselves for that global awakening that is surely to come. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. Father, give us receptive hearts like those Ninevites and like the king of Nineveh. Give us soft hearts, Father God. Grant us the gift of faith to simply take you at your word like Abraham did, like the Ninevites did. And thus we will not fall from the grace of God of your justification by faith alone. But Father, we have seen that you had already been preparing the soil in the Ninevites' hearts through all the various calamities that they had experienced. So Father, we pray, and may we continually pray that that's what this year, the year 2020, with all its mess, is all about. That it is a season in which you are preparing the ground for an international revival. Father, we ask for that. Revive us, Father God. Turn us to you. And may your people be ready for that time when that awakening comes. May we not be still asleep in our sins. But may we wake up and get off the throne. Get off from being the center of our universe. Get off from desiring glory that is only due Jesus. May we submit ourselves and yield ourselves to Jesus Christ only as our Lord. May Jesus Christ rule over us as the King of Kings. And thus may we experience personal revival in our hearts first before that time comes. So get us ready, Father. Get us ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's receive the blessing from God. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and the strengthening and the filling of the Holy Spirit 
be with you now and forevermore. Amen.